It is a great pleasure for me to have with us today Professor Andriy Danilenko, who is Professor of Russian Slavic Linguistics at Pace University. One of the remarkable things about Professor Danilenko is that he's an, a traditional old-fashioned Slavic linguist, which from what I can tell is a, is a disappearing field. That's only, that's only part of me, you know, honestly. <laughs> a disappearing field in North America to a certain extent. Let me tell you just a few words about uh, Professor Danilenko. Professor Danilenko is, of course, from Ukraine. He, uh, his education was back on that side of the, the, the big pond. He has a degree in general linguistics from uh, Moscow's uh, Friendship University. He also has a degree uh, from Kharkiv University. And he is a most prolific, most prolific author. I certainly will not, if I started reading his CV to you, he wouldn't have time to give you a talk. So I'm, I'm just going to highlight a, a few items from his uh, very wide-ranging uh, academic career. He is the author of books on Slavica et Islamica, Ukrainian in Context, which came out in 2006. Then uh, a book in Ukrainian on predicates, cases, and diatheses in the history and typology of the Ukrainian language. But clearly something for me, since I don't know what those things are. But Absolutely. Whatever. That's, it's, the, it's nice to be a non-linguist introducing a linguist because linguists are always very tolerant of, oh, sure. of ignorant people. Absolutely. Like so. This is why I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> he is also a co-editor of a number of important uh, publications. One in particular I'll, I'll mention. He and uh, Serhii Vakulenko are co-editors of Studien zur Sprache, Literatur und Kultur bei den Slaven, Gedenkschrift für George Shevinov, and that's a figure I want to mention in particular. Professor Danilenko uh, had the good fortune of actually working closely with the late Professor Shevinov. He is a translator of uh, his uh, historical phonology. Shevinov wrote the historical phonology in English, and it needed to be translated into Ukrainian, something okay. which Shevinov didn't get around to in his own uh, time. So Professor Danilenko was the translator of that, and has in fact been a, a kind of promoter of the legacy of uh, Professor Shevilov, in addition to his, his own particular works. As I say, the, the list of his publications, the, very, the breadth of his publications, in fact, is, is so large that I'm, I'm going to stop there and turn to today's topic, which is of particular interest to me because it's linguistics with a, 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 a hook into something that we non-linguists can get our hands into. And that is the, the very important question in the development of Ukrainian language in the 19th century. Of course, how does a language that is not only uh, proscribed in the Russian Empire and not in active use and certainly not used in universities and other places. How does a language like that rise to the level of a modern language? How does a essentially peasant language find its place in the world and how does it develop in terms of uh, lexical development, in terms of all the modern qualities of a language that need to be there? And in particular, as you can see from the title, what we will hear today is about the important role of Pantelemon Kulish, and particularly Pantelemon Kulish as a translator in formulating the, the various qualities of modern Ukrainian. With that, I invite Professor Danilenko, please. Thank you. Um, before I start, uh, perhaps right now I can just uh, see how many people I have in the room. I have several flyers. so. That's about this publication, if you would kindly have it, and I uh, have several also here. The book uh, which I would like just to, to talk about today, it's kind of a, 
uh, mistake, I would put it it. Because in 2008, when I submitted the project uh, at Harvard University, when I uh, got a Schklar Fellowship, so I decided to write a history of literary Ukraine in general, everything, for several hundred years and so and so and so on. When then I realized, and I studied, I made a mistake. I started writing a book with an introduction. So I have good experience. I never do this, but I decided just, okay, why not? I would start with an introduction. And then I realized, because I cannot write a history of uh, literary Ukrainian, stated Ukrainian with a, such a figure as Kulish, because at that moment I knew practically nothing about him. I knew that he was prescribed in the Soviet Union. I knew that I was strictly forbidden just to mention his name. And actually, we had some publications definitely from time to time appearing in the Soviet Union and later definitely in the, um, after the independence, actually. And uh, so that's, as I told you, a result of this mistake. And then suddenly I decided I will put aside this major project that will concentrate on Kulish. Uh, because the question of the Bible at that moment, I was also impressed and I was interested uh, in different interpretations uh, of the Bible. I decided to, to look into this figure and uh, to look into his, well, translations as uh, products which we can conceive of as something which contributed to the formation of standard Ukrainian. I was not interested in, let's put it like this, in strategies, well, in faithfulness of the translation to the regional. That's not my case. I was basically interested in this linguistic means, in this language which he introduced in his translations, and how he contributed by this to the formation of standard Ukrainian. Um, for me, it was an enigma, it was a puzzle who actually Kulish was, and so I decided to work on this figure in general. Uh, definitely, I was more interested even in his vision of uh, the language itself, uh, of a standard language. At that time, the language, that was not the standard language, it actually. He was working on a kind of a literary language. It was a written variety of something which they used to speak, for example, in both historical parts of Ukraine at that time. Uh, I was also interested why, for example, he chose these works for his translations, because at the very beginning of his career, he was against, 100% against any kind of translations into vernacular Ukrainian. And then he suddenly changed his views, but that's business as usual, definitely, with the Pantelemon Kulish. He was used to change his views from time to time. So I would like just to go over these uh, questions, because all these questions are reflected and uh, studied and analyzed in this uh, uh, book, which I brought to me, a couple of copies, which you can take a look at them. Uh, I was proud, first of all, that Kulish was from that part of Ukraine which I originally come from. Perhaps I went from Sloboda, but actually he was closer to Sloboda than to uh, Lichina at that time. I knew also that he was a prominent philosopher, okay, historian. Definitely he was a writer and he was, and I was much surprised that he was the first uh, professional journalist, in fact. So before him, nobody was professionally engaged in journalism writing both in Ukrainian and in Russian about Ukrainian topics, on Ukrainian topics as well. So that already was enough just to get attracted to this personality and to his, well, uh, legacy and to his language and to his works in particular in uh, his translations. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, picture. You can just find all these photos definitely online. But why, I will tell you later, because he's together with Mikola Kostomarov. At that time, they were friends. Later, something happened definitely, and they became more estranged, I would say, and they became not friends, not intimate friends, at least. Uh, Kulish, that's uh, a bundle of uh, controversies, of different, well, conflicting views and conflicting um, interpretations in his creative works, and also about him, actually. I remember that Serhii uh, Yefremov at the beginning of the 20th century wrote that Kulish was without any synthesis. So if you look at the personality of Kulish, you wouldn't find any synthesis of views, like something very complex or something very well engaged and something very well uh, logically well constructed. 
And I decided just to go over his <laughs> conflicting views and conflicting actions and take a look at something what he did and something that when he redid this, in fact. First of all, definitely he was a partisan of Ukrainian culture, language, and the legacy, everything which was connected with the Ukrainian people and uh, their history and so on and so on. And he was fighting for a full-fledged language. Actually, that was his major objective, to create a full-fledged standard Ukrainian at that time. Okay, it, we can conceive it as a kind of a literary language. But take a look at the same time he supported Russia. I mean, he supported the empire in terms, for example, of uh, Peter the Great, Catherine II, and all this interesting, well, controversial, I would say, mm, views. You can just find them in his uh, work, two-volume work, uh, The History of the Reunification of Rus, which appeared in 1874-77, when he became so much disillusioned with the different reviews of his compatriots in both parts of Ukraine, negative reviews. So he just simply decided, what I am doing with them, because they cannot understand my works, they cannot appreciate my input, they cannot understand my contribution to our national revival. So he's expressed admiration, okay, for Russian Tsars. He made some humiliating remarks, definitely, about Taras Rivchenko, and uh, everybody was just simply surprised. Everybody was scolding him. Most of the uh, populists in both parts uh, of Ukraine definitely could not accept it. And uh, especially when he debunked the myth of the Cossacks and their history, they just simply cannot accept any kind of this stance of his at that time. Uh, take a look that in uh, for three years, actually for three years, he served and he was part of this Russian government administration in Poland. Uh, and he was not just a simple clerk. I remember that he became a kind of a director for some time of uh, a department which was in charge of spiritual affairs in Warsaw, in the whole country, in Poland, in the kingdom of Poland at that time. Uh, he worked in uh, the archives, in the libraries, definitely. He, he already was working, by the way, at that time on uh, his translation of the Bible. We don't have certain, well, information about this, but something from his letters, from his correspondence, we know that he, at the time of russifying the Poles, he was working on some Ukrainian topics and translating the Bible. But the point is that he was not just simply a partisan of Russification of Poland, he was just simply against, he was ambivalent, definitely, he was against Polish acculturation of uh, the Ukrainian people in general. This is why he could not accept, for example, uh, Polish Catholicism in uh, the form which was propagated at that time by Polish patriots. And definitely he, he was against everything. And he supported, by the way, the idea of uh, introduction of Russian totally in uh, local education. He was supportive of this idea, despite the fact that he was a Ukrainian patriot at that time, definitely. Uh, at that he was so disappointed in some actions of his compatriots and his friends and some populists uh, in both parts of Ukraine that he decided, even mostly in uh, Russia-ruled Ukraine, that he decided just to leave <laughs> the Russian Empire and become a citizen of uh, Austria-Hungary. He submitted his application, but it took them so long to process his application that at some point he, he changed his decision as always. The business as usual with uh, Pantelimon Kulish. He decided just to give up and he decided to remain a citizen of the uh, Russian Empire of Russia. It was a difficult, definite, definitely, process because he had to go through the procedure of becoming like a new citizen of Russia. It was a, a deal at that time. Um, when I look at all these well facts and these controversial uh, moments in his. Uh, creative life and his personal life, I realized, okay, something should be very interesting about his uh, linguistic as well um, output, or let's put it like this, even literary output, not from the point of uh, literary criticism, in fact, but from the point of view of creating national literature and uh, his vision of this literature and the language which should be used in this. Also, do not forget that I, when I, that's uh, from my personal uh, 
well, from my personal work on Kulish, that I was impressed definitely by uh, Lutsky's monograph, which was actually the first uh, English language monograph on Kulish, which appeared uh, in, 18, in 1983. And uh, I liked the book when I just read it, well, when preparing for my work on Kulish, and especially was impressed that the book was read by George Y. Shevelov at some moment. So that's a high quality monograph, despite the fact that it was written here without access to all these archives and all these, well, documents and uh, manuscripts and photograph and so on and so on. And when I started working on this in 2008, I was so happy to find that Nachlik Yevhen at that time published a two-volume monograph uh, uh, on Kulish, uh, which is a fun fantastic source of information of uh, bibliographical items, references, uh, names, uh, well, dates, and so on and so on. You, you can just simply can refer to this uh, book and you can just find everything which you are looking at least about Kulish and his work and literary output. Uh, take a look at uh, when I realized uh, that Kulish is so pe pe peculiar normalizer of the Ukrainian language. So take a look at some of uh, those points in his program. First of all, his model or his program was quite positivist at that moment. This is why they could not accept it by default. In Kharkiv at that time, they still have they still had this romanticist. Still the tradition of this Kharkiv romanticism was so powerful at that moment, predominant at that time. And uh, the younger generation of Galician populists could not accept it as well because they were in their own framework, I would say, intellectual, literary, and uh, uh, so they, they cannot just easily switch to the model proposed by Kulish. Believe me, he was far ahead, it seems to me, Kulish, even not only in comparison with, uh, for example, Kostomarov, I will tell you, or Fitkovich, Ivan Nichulevitsky, uh, I have to admit this, and even Ivan Frankor, at least on the material of uh, translations, uh, some translations of Shakespeare. And definitely, his view of uh, the creation of literary language was a unique, unique at that time, because he wanted to use as many dialects as possible and uh, consider as many chronological layers in the history of language as possible. And believe me, practically nobody was ready to accept it at that time. Uh, take a look at uh, some uh, most uh, famous translations uh, by Kulish, also in, uh, together with uh, Pouloui, which I studied well and which I well worked with them. First of all, uh, I like the first publication, which is the so-called Pentateuch Musiri. If I'm not mistaken, yes, this is how it looks this uh, title page. Svete pismo, pyat knih Musievich, but in general, it is called Pentateuch Musiri. A, phen a phenomenal, it seems to me, translation of Job Yov. I like it. I, I can read it one again and again. I'm not uh, well, a, a huge partisan of poetry in general, but when you compare this biblical well, book with the translation of Kulish, you see a phenomenal approach which is not typical of the translators at that time. Psaltira Bokniha which appeared in 1871, and uh, I will skip the next position, uh, and as you see in co-authorship with the Pulu, he translated four Gospels, and uh, here you see these different uh, publications, uh, separate publications of some of those Gospels. Then together they appeared in 1880 and several editions of this publication. Finally, the Bible, which is available, I guess, at the local library everywhere, the Bible by Kulish and uh, Pulu. But what you don't know, and you've never read about it, I know that even in this collection of uh, the works of Kulish, they are not including this. This is the so-called Ustikhatvora na Biblia, the versified Bible, which Kulish created, and he translated at least several books. That is a unique phenomenon at that time. I know that right now we have some versified versions of the translation of the Bible, but when he did it in the late 1980s, 
eighties, uh, before his uh, death in 1897, he was still working on this. This is uh, a very interesting interpretation of the translation of the Bible. Uh, I, if we have some people from Galicia or from Halicina, definitely they would tell you that Kulish is not that much unique personal per persona, so to speak, because uh, uh, Markian Shashkevich translated something before Kulish, and Kulish should not be treated as the a kind of a pioneer in this well process. Definitely, Markian Shashkevich was the first one to translate something already in a kind of vernacular Ukrainian. He wanted to do this, and he translated several well parts of chapters from uh, uh, the Gospel according to Matthew and the whole, it seems to me, translation of the Gospel to John, which was published in 1912 by Wozniak, which, we, well, which is interesting, uh, no intrusion, so to speak, or editorial intrusion into this, well, uh, translation was made by Wozniak, but still it was too late. Listen, the translation was done in 1842. It appeared in 1912. So many years passed. So many, well, translations already appeared. So basically, it, it's, it's behind. It's something left. And the language, by the way, is quite peculiar. They call him, they called this language, not Shashkevich himself, by some critics, Narodny Tserkovno Ruski, with the two S, Ruski Yazik. Not Ruski, but Ruski Yazik, which is, as you see, just something in Russian church use Russian in this case, Russian church vernacular. Take a look if you would like just to see what's the point behind this language. If you're familiar with this, uh, uh, so Shashkevich on the left side column, if you look through the text, and so on and so on. And compare this with the translation of Kulish and the Pului from this, well, edition of 1903. Even if you're not familiar with the church Slavonic, you can see the difference between the translations. First of all, Krestitel in Markevich, and you have this vernacular variety for the Ukrainian uh, uh, standard. Uh, you have Krestitel, definitely. Then you have Propovidujushi with a suffix, which is church Slavonic suffix. And definitely you won't find this church Slavonic suffix in uh, Polish and Pului. You have only Yuchi, like Laholuchi. And in, uh, for example, Hrishkevich, you have Klitushoho. Then you have here also Pushta, as you see, and uh, uh, Kulish and Pulu use in this case Pustina, which is okay, which is not definitely too much vernacular Ukrainian, but still it's closer to something which is not Church Slavonic. It's, it's. So, even statistically, if you compare the number of Church Slavonicism in this text, you will believe that this is a mixture. That's a mixture of some vernacular Ukrainian with a good admixture of Church Slavonicism as compared with the Kulish. The I wouldn't say they hated Kulish, but they didn't like him, in Galicia at least. Especially after, well, his translations which started appearing from one year to another uh, from the Bible. And they decided just to write back, to fight back, so to speak, and to propose their own visions of this. Uh, and if you don't know this personality, this writer, perhaps you will Google this, and uh, I was quite fascinated by the existence of this uh, uh, person. Uh, that's Antin Kobulansky, Anton Kobulansky. You will find a couple of encyclopedic entries about him. But he, in terms of translation, he decided just to do better than Kulish. And he decided what? He decided to translate and to use two scripts. So he basically published two varieties, two versions of his translation of a couple of Gospels into Cyrillic and into his own by him invented Roman script. While well, you will see this. Uh, they claim, at least it seems to me that uh, Horbach, in one of his articles, 
row that perhaps he prepared this for immigrants going to North America. So because they were not that much familiar with a okay, second generation or something with a Cyrillic, let them use, for example, the Roman variety of this, so to speak. And take a look what it looks like. It's ph it's phenomenal <laughs> invention because that's what he invented on the right hand side. If you compare with the Cyrillic version, Bulva Chasov Iroda, and then you have on the right Bulva Zachaso of uh, Iroda. He is using some, by the way, Romanian characters. It is a combination of different diacritics borrowed from different uh, scripts uh, because it's only just a sample. But if you look through the whole translation, you will see that, yes, he is quite inventive in borrowing all these diacritics from different, basically Romanian and something from the Czech script. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to read, by the way, in uh, this type of uh, Latin letters. Uh, well, we can handle this, for this hard check. Okay, it's used in scholarly transcription today, so basically, perhaps, we'll figure it out. But this is, <laughs> do we need this? Especially, for example, in the late 19th century, to have this publication in Cyrillic. And you cannot, by the way, you won't find any edition or any copy of these publications in Ukraine. Some people in Lviv ask me about this copy because, luckily, Harvard, when I was at Harvard, the, we ordered a couple of copies at uh, the library of the Bible Society, which is based and which is uh, at uh, the library of Cambridge University, actually. So we made this copy, so I have practically all copies, both Cyrillic and both Roman varieties, so to speak, in my possession, and I sometimes borrow it to my friends in Ukraine. Uh, and now, just for comparison, take a look at this uh, Cyrillic variety of Kabbalansky translation in comparison with Polish translation. Uh, Kobylanski każe jemu kobieta, kobieta, przepraszam na razie, to, to będzie już po polsku. Uh, well, okay, Galician vernacular. Uh, panie, ani czerpala nie masz, a studnia, again, Polish, uh, je hluboka, odki odzie masz wodu żywu, odpowiew Jezus i każe jej po pyci, that's a typical southwest Ukrainian form, Pyuci vody se ji prahnuti bude znov, kaže do neho ženščina, again, that's like a Galician koine. Pane, daj mi takoj vody, što bim ne prahnula, a ne hodila sudi začerati. Kuliš is much better in this case, because he is, he does not want to be limited by these dialectal constraints, so to, 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 so to speak. Kaže ju možinka, dobrodiju i črpaka ne maješ i kolodje z hliboki, zvitki ljaž maješ vodu živu. Listen, that's, that's Ukrainian, that's vernacular Ukrainian, that's not exactly, that's not Sloboda Ukrainian, it's not even Chernihiv Ukrainian, that's something which we call central Dnipa Ukrainian in most uh, of these features. Ozvavs Isus i reče ji, vseki kto pije vodu, siu zabažaje znov, kaže do neho žinka, dobrodiju, daj me nisi je vodi, šob žaždovala, that's perhaps one of those dialectal forms which he used in this translation. What's very interesting, using his translations and publications, he used all these stresses, so accents, so you know how to stress these words, at least in the late 19th century. Uh, and this is just a copy I made, as I told you, a copy of this versified Bible. That's two or three only books translated in verse. And um, this is one of those uh, uh, pages prepared by Kulish himself. He had a wonderful handwriting, actually. So, Staroruski Pereklad Sjatoho Pisma, Staroho i Novoho Zapovi Du, that's his version, and so on and so on. And Kulish Olelkovic Panko, that's his uh, nickname which he used in this case. And it was prepared, by the way, for the publication in Lviv, Zadohledom, as you see, by Mikhailo Pavlik, with whom he was very close at the end of his life, and Mikhailo Pavlik in Galicia, and Bukovina ruled Ukraine, was active at that time. So as you see, the translation of this versified Bible, that's, it's a fantastic text. Marno rozum do početku svito hoće se honuti, se honuti. 
бо й сам розум немовлятком у ті давно мусив бути, як на слово ж став багати на спасенний дар природи, став в зедему вивождати всі коліна, всі народи. The only form вивождати, that's church Slavonic, kind of. They decided just to keep it. But this is, yeah, this is poetry. And this is the whole Bible which he planned to translate. I can even, it's so hard to imagine what a fantastic output it would be. And unfortunately, he died and could not complete his translation. Uh, and in several, well, the second part of my <coughs> book, actually, part two in this book, deals with uh, Shakespeare. Why? I will tell you why, because it was so important for Kulish to make these translations. So in total, take a look at the Ukrainian Shakespeare in uh, the interpretation of Kulish. So we have translated, if I'm not mistaken, 11 or 12 uh, uh, works by Shakespeare and, uh, according to some rumors, the Merchant of Venice and Cymbeline was also translated by him. And when these translations were, were uh, given to Karnavsky the junior at that time, they got lost it somewhere. But definitely the widow of Kulish, Barvinok, wrote that Kulish had translated also those two plays. So these are just simply uh, uh, photos of these first publications and uh, this is actually I'm using from uh, Nachlik, I think would not be offended, I used it from his monograph. Why he decided to do this? Because he didn't like Cossacks. Despite the fact that he was from the, fel from the family of Chernihiv Cossacks, he hated them at that moment when he worked on the translation of Shakespeare. And he wrote about this, calling the Ukrainians people without any sense, honor, and respect, as well as truth and the letters, who were formed by heavy drinkers, chicken ears, and great brigands, and the author claimed that they had been saved from their ravaged national existence by the ancestors' language only. So these Ukrainian uh, Cossacks, or Ukrainian, the Ukrainian people, just they survived only because they kept the language, because they did not forget something which helped them to survive. Uh, when he published, by the way, his first translation, and his first translation which was published, the only publication of Shakespeare when he, were, when he was alive, that's 1882, and only three plays were published, as you see, Othello, Troilus and Cressida, and Comedy of Errors in 1882. And take a look at those reviews, at these reviews. Omilan Partitsky, he was a personal enemy, it seems to me, of Kulish at some point, because they were friends before that, but then they just simply, at least Partitsky just could not stand, would not just simply mention the name of Kulish and take it his uh, critique. So, uh, Kulish used the lofty style and the natural language, because Partitsky did not like, for example, Velmi, so many times used, then duże inst instead of duże, fortuna, jechidny, jasuvaty, and so many words in nie, like svitkovanie. Okay, velmi, that's middle Ukrainian form. Why he was complaining? That was not borrowed, by the way, from Polish. That was true Ukrainian form, actually, from the 14th, 15th century. Fortuna, okay, Yehidni, definitely, that's Russian Church Slavonic form, but, and I will tell you later why, why Kulish decided to, to use this. Yasuvati, that's a neologism we, from the word Yasni, clear, transparent. So just Kulish just created a verb, Yasuvati, to make transparent, to make, to clarify something. Anachronistic terms, take a look. Amen, no way. Otamania, okay, we can think and we can debate this. Brona, and we'll tell you later, Brona instead of Brahma, Partiski didn't like Brona, then Hvir instead of Hvoroba, Pocheski instead of Chesno, Partiski did not know the word. Partiski just simply was an uh, ignorant, he did not know even local dialects, because the word Brona, that's a very old Middle Ukrainian form which was borrowed from Polish. It was a Middle Polish, Middle Ukrainian form which was still used in some Ukrainian dialects. And Kulish used it to make his, well, style just, you know, that's lofty style, that's high style. He wanted to use something which was chronologically belonging to the preceding layer of the language itself. 
So he, he knew Brahma, but he wanted Brona. And if you look it up, you will find this in still in these dictionaries today. Pochesky, that central Dnieper Ukrainian form, which means, okay, honestly, Pochesky, that's not in Czech. That means honestly, friendly. And if you open the dictionary of Rinchenko, you will find this form, Pochesky. He skazal Pochesky. He told this friendly. And so on, so on. So I, I do not believe that Pratitsky was a good critique and reviewer in this case. Unfortunately, he was quite, I wouldn't say illiterate, but he was ignorant and he didn't know something which Kulish already by that time just knew. Uh, take a look at Mykola Kostomara, who simultaneously in Russian ruled Ukraine wrote something about Kulish, wrote about his translations. Can you imagine in, under what circumstances Kulish had to live in this case? You have this critique from Galic Galicina, Galicina, from Galicia, and at the same time your compatriot writes li like this. Do we need these translations according to Kostomara? No, we don't need them. Why he's doing this? It's absurd, because little Russian cannot be used in this case. Everybody speaks Russian. It's only for Galicians, because they are so smart, they just invented, invented their own language. They can figure out what you're writing about using this language. Little Russian who is not familiar with literal Russian, there is no a person in the Russian Empire among the Ukrainians himself. That was strange. And definitely there was something personal about this. And believe me, there was something personal, and I'm going, not going into these details, unfortunately, Kulish was sometimes a reason behind all these personal changes, or changes in the personal uh, relationship. But Kostomarov, you look at the Kostomarov, who decided to, excuse me, to criticize Kulish? Take a look. That is the first Ukrainian translation of Shakespeare ever made in vernacular Ukrainian. Kostomarov wrote this, and it was published in 1890. It was definitely done before. It was just a collection of his words. Oi, verbice zelene, that's Desdemona. Verbunko moja, pred verbuje zelenoje divočka sedile, bidnoje golovonjku, doli pohilila. Oi, verbice zelene, verbunko moja. So that's Ukrainian Desdemona. If you look, if you open any collection of Ukrainian songs, you would not distinguish, you would not see any difference between this Ukrainian Desdemona and true Ukrainian folk song or something like this. So definitely that's not the caliber of Kulish, at least in as the translator. Uh, in 1928, uh, the Yaroslav Hordinsky in uh, um, Alicia published a critical essay, I would say. It's approximately 100 something pages full of criticism of Kulish. So even 1928 in Galicia, they still wanted to fight against Kulish. Still Kulish's translation, something which they could not accept, and I will tell you why. So take a, this typical, take a look at this typical, well, um, moments in this critique. So the translator was very unselective in his language. <laughs> okay. Russian is so many Russian forms, you cannot read the translation in 1928. Yes, okay. good guard, yes. I love it. Because in Russian, Yelza, and Prikashchik. Because in Russian, yes, Prikashchik. You have so many church Slavonicism, which, why he used them, like Zhizn, Vertograd, Blahochesti, and Sokrovishcha. That's the plural form with a stressing on the last vowel. I've never used this before. I, I cannot say Sokrovishcha, definitely. Well, we, we can, you can agree that Nelza, which is used by Kulish, it's something so strange. But you cannot just simply pick up some words and then tell that the whole translation doesn't work because you don't like only those 10 or 15 words from the whole translation. Give me, criticize the whole texture, give me a general idea, picture of what is wrong about this. Gordinsky, in fact, was uh, a follower of Franco, because uh, Franco, that nemesis, that's Franco and Kulish, that you should write a novel about them. 
actually, I think that Coolidge was okay when his well ambivalent stance and uh, approach and uh, reaction to Franco's uh, well a criticism. But Franco, it seems to me, was obsessed, just simply obsessed with Coolidge. Take a look at this, what he wrote about him. Premise on the faulty understanding of the Ukrainian language. These translations, translations of Shakespeare, cannot satisfy our taste. And then he just numerates, but what, what does this have to do? I mean, his hatred of Cossacks with the translation itself. Kulish passed over vernacular Ukrainian, tried to create, especially for his translations, a certain old Russian language, that is Ukrainian, with purportedly archaic, yet in fact short Slavonic and Muscovite coloring. Okay, the language looks awkward, scholastic, naive. So in Ukrainian, it's scholastichno uh, dubova mova, something like this. I was just struggling to find uh, an adequate translation for this, as far as the lexicon is concerned, and so on and so on. But I cannot understand why Kulish in 1905 wrote this. Okay, Kulish died in 1897 because in 1899 he wrote something different. Kulish is a first rate star in our literature, a great expert in our vernacular, as well as a great expert in the language and literatures of the European peoples. So, what, what happened? Something definitely did happen. So he switched <laughs> just simple positions. I, I, because that's from the introduction to Hamlet, if I'm not mistaken, and 1905, that's another introduction to another translation, because Franco took over editing all his translations after the death of Kulish. But, but Lutsky, in 1983, take a look, he was just quite clear in his assessment. Kulish translations are in many respects unsurpassed even today, primarily because of the great linguistic virtuosity, especially in the light of the translations made by his predecessors and contemporaries. And this is perhaps the last example to show you that Franco perhaps was not entitled to criticize the translation of Kulish. Because Franco later offered his own translation of King Lear, and take a look at the translation. Left side. В мені та сама кров, щире серце каже ми, що також моя любов така, як і її, лиш втім моя сильніша, всі утіхи, всі розкоші життя, ніччо для мене, моє єдине щастя, то любов для вас мій отче і царю. And take a look at Kulish, Stohoj Metalu Ya, and look at the original. I'm made of that self metal. Okay, speaking about the faithfulness of the translation. Ya is shoy sestrice, cinit me ne poni, skaju vit serce, vana mo vinila iz ust u mene, jak le lublu vas et ne skazala tilko, sho ya vsih inchih radu shiv tsurayus, yaki ni yevne vishi sferi chustva, i tilke mene shastia sho blubite vas drohi velichestvo. So the only which strikes you in this translation, I can tell you, Velichestvo. So Kulish decided to use this for his loft, lofty style, for his high style. That's the only form which he decided to implement here. But look at this dialect-based, 100% based translation of Franco. You have these proclitic forms like me, which are not allowed in standard language. Silnisha, definitely that's a regional form. Nicho. Municho, okay, but I would like just to use something different in this case. Shastia, that's a typical okay Western Ukrainian form. I can accept it, okay, it's also Northern Ukrainian. We have this Shastia as in, in, in Halicina. And Levas mi Ocha Itzari. So he was speaking about Church Slavonicism in Kulish and he used Ocha plus Tsariu. And do you remember Franco told him you use so many Russian forms? Unbelievable. Here we are. You have the Russian form Tsariu and you have Ocha, the Church Slavonic form. And Kulish uses the Lichistvo, which is a neutral form, lofty style form, but still it is not well, related to, for example, Russia or to old Church Slavonic tradition. Now, basically, coming closer to the conclusion, so what was the vision of Kulish in this case? The vision was quite simple. He wanted just simply to create something which was quite, well, called by him Starorushina, which was so typical of Ukrainian, and he wanted to create something which they could be proud, like a legacy. And this is my last uh, uh, slide, if 
you take a look, for example, at the language program of Pantelemon Kulish, which was based on multi-regionalism, he was open to all dialects. He was cosmopolitan a kind of cosmopolitanism, because he was open to any kind of borrowing from any language. By the way, he used vkontentuvati from the Polish okay, language. He used something even uh, from the English original, just simply transliterating the form into Ukrainian. He was a, that was a synthetic vision of new standard Ukrainian. What was going on definitely in uh, Ukraine, in Russian ruled Ukraine, that was totally regionalism, yes. That was kind of parochialism, yes. And one homestead, they would fight for a language which is based only on one dialect. They could not accept, for example, forms from southwest Ukraine, and they could not accept some other forms which do not belong, for example, to this locale. Central Ukrainian, for example, mm -hmm. area. Speaking about Ivan Franco, Franco was a kind of a Democrat, so he decided just to allow for the existence of multiple homesteads. So he was propounding the idea of many, many standard Ukrainians, as many as possible. So every single village could create a standard language, according to Franco, at some point. Kulish was against it. He was for one standard language based on all practical dialects, but it was just quite a synthetic view. And unfortunately, this synthetic view was just pre practically doomed because Kulish was not approved, was not accepted, neither either in Galicia or Russian-ruled Ukraine. They were based on this vernacular vision, only vernacular-based language. They were fighting for this. We know the reason behind this, definitely. But Kulish was so original, he created actually a third way. And this way, unfortunately, did not survive because he was so synthetic, nobody was ready at that moment to accept his synthetic view. And Shevelov, George Shevelov in 1966, it seems to me for the first time, wrote about Kulish as a synthesizer of different styles, of different chronological layers in the history of Ukrainian literary tradition, let's put it like this. And he mentioned that Kulish was a unique personality, even as compared with Shevchenko. And I believe that Kulish is more original as Shevchenko in terms of the foundation or as founder of this new standard Ukrainian language. So the book is basically is devoted to those, well, ideas which I just, well, presented today. And uh, I, I'm not sure that somebody would be very interested in this book because who cares about the English, for example, book about this uh, maverick, Ukrainian maverick, I call him, yes, who created the personal vision, uh, his personal language program, yes. But again, that's not about uh, translations themselves, that's just actually, yes, about normalization, about the normalization of standard Ukrainian at that time, and I hope that perhaps this book will find some readers in the future. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm sure our speaker will answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, I, I once worked with the uh, Ukrainian translations of Romeo and Juliet, and uh, I was surprised how archaic uh, Polish's version was compared. That there were five versions of translations, and not, and I think uh, the second one by Voronei was only twenty years apart. But his and all next ones were sound very modern. We can read them today, but Polish's uh, were archaic. And at the same time, when we read uh, his translation of the Bible, it looks modern. So did he do this on purpose? Stylized his language of Shakespeare, made it uh, sound old. Because uh, English speakers, when they read Shakespeare, it doesn't sound modern to them. So maybe he wanted uh, Ukrainian readers also to feel that it's an old uh, work of literature. I remember he even not only translated, he changed, changed a lot of things, like introduced Cossacks there, which obviously are not in Romeo and Juliet. So. Well, perhaps yeah, from uh, this perspective of our modern perspective, 
uh, Kulish can be well characterized as an uh, archaic, for example, well, translation archaic. And uh, there are some specialists uh, in uh, Ukrainian translation studies who claim that Kulish, that's part of our history only. Just forget about his translations. The problem is not in his translation. The, that's not uh, the problem of uh, the low quality of his translation. That's the problem of his language program, which he wanted just to implement and to show everybody that you have to expand your vision because your language cannot be, for example, vernacular based only. And that was the thesis of most of these normalizers at that time. And he was fighting against them. This is why he decided just to fight against the Cossacks, but still he was ready to use this terminology, for example, Cossack or Otaman and so on, not because he liked them, because he wanted just to look into the history of the language and he was ready just to, to grab something from this layer, from this layer, and from this layer, and also in space, different dialects. So we're thinking about in terms of history and space. And our authors and Vorani were thinking only already in terms of space. What was used in Central Dnieper Ukrainian, what was used in Standard Ukrainian in the 1920s. So he was ready to use only that. He was afraid of going, taking a step. It was perhaps too late, definitely, to change something for that purpose. I have a question. Uh, I wrote the book on uh, Sir Walter Scott's influence on uh, Holland and Kulish. Mm. Uh, I'm Romano Buddy. Um, so, um, in, in, in my book, I <laughs> uh, presented the influence of Sir Walter Scott, uh, who, similarly to Kulish, uh, praised the old um, heroic uh, culture. Uh, but saw it as finished mm -hmm. and uh, basically rejected the romanticism of uh, what was prevalent at that time. But um, uh, promoted the uh, ideas of the Enlightenment. Uh, and, and it's this um, uh, promotion of the Enlightenment views, the universality, you know, which is so much this synthesizing uh, aspect, uh, that it was, uh, it was based on um, the, the Scottish Enlightenment philosophers and, you know, the whole Enlightenment philosophy, 18th century, and of course that supported the uh, empire because it did not, it saw um, uh, nations, you know, with souls and, you know, these uh, heroic uh, cultures, basically as uh, something of the past, you know. So in that sense, he was in conflict with his contemporaries because, you know, they were mm -hmm. all promoting uh, these views. But um, I think he was able to, uh, it wasn't just Sir Walter Scott and the Enlightenment, uh, but, but also um, the uh, St. Petersburg Koteri, the, the Polish um, uh, writers who supported empire. Uh, and there was a big influence on Kulish of uh, uh, Polish, especially in his childhood, uh, of some of the, uh, uh, the families, the settled families in where he lived. Uh, and Grabowski, uh, writer, uh, also. So, so he had these Enlightenment views, and 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 he promoted them. And, and uh, I, I think also because he was such a gifted linguist, uh, he he went to the originals. Like my um, my understanding is that he went to the actual original English. Yes. Yeah. So we, we, he learned it. Yes, he studied, picked it. He picked yeah, something yeah. English. Yeah, because um, he, uh, he he was so uh, talented linguistically. I remember that uh, you know reading that Kostomarov and Kulish uh, would converse in Old Church Slavonic just for fun. You know they uh, so his. Um, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. You're right. And. Uh, 
this enlightenment, yes, that was just simply the foundation of his, well, plans of translation of Shakespeare, definitely. He decided just to grab Shakespeare and work with him only just to make sure that the Ukrainian people finally understands the mission, the universal mission of all peoples and uh, the Ukrainians in particular. He wanted just to elevate this level, the level of culture and everything else. This is why he debunked the Cossacks and everything which was related to this. And you're right, and he's, he was so closely, yes, related to Poles. And unfortunately, definitely, and uh, his uh, uh, mansion, let's put it like this, his uh, homestead was burned down thanks to a Polish uh, renter or something like this, Zaleski, a certain Zaleski who perhaps uh, put fire and just because of these old translations of Kulish burned down during this fire. So, and but already being even before his going uh, to uh, Warsaw, he wrote in uh, already actively, he was writing in his correspondence, he has some letters that let's forget about this Polish legacy, let's forget about this Polish culture, the presence of this element, we have to reject this completely. And that was his, well, possibly, for example, while trying to translate with Pului, it was just the late, or well, the early 1870s already, he just simply told him, if you see a form which is your local, which is so much Polish, drop this, use even better Church Slavonic, because then you will be closer to our roots. So he perhaps he, he was so influenced by this that he decided just somehow to, just you know just to get from this influence to the extent that he wanted to create something new without these ties. But he was enlightened, yes, and he was a positivist to some extent at the end of his career, so. Yeah, well, I mean, it was based on rational principles. Yeah, mostly. You know, so mm -hmm. in that sense, the enlightenment. And, and the classical tradition overlapped with the positivism and, and realism, you know, in, in rejecting the, mm -hmm. the, the romantic, uh, romanticist premises. Yeah, I, I touched this only on passant because mostly I was interested in his language program, but definitely, yes, and I try just to to, well, to take into consideration also these visions and views and everything which he, well, cherished at that time in his existence. Uh, so, like, what, what languages um, did, did he actually know? Like, I... Um, that's, that's a good question, yes, actually. Uh, Francois uh, wrote that Kulish, and Partiski also before this wrote that, that Kulish uh, uh, speaks no language at all. He, he knows Russian and Ukrainian, and this is it. But in fact, definitely he was reading already when he was in Tula, when he was first exile or whatever. He was already uh, uh, learning and studying actively English at that time, plus German, definitely, because he was uh, actively plagiarizing later <laughs> uh, some German authors and just presenting like, his own article, and Franco decided not to publish article because it was completely based on the Russian translation of the original, uh, of the German language original. And also he took some lessons with Jan Boudou and de Courtenay. I was so surprised. He took some lessons in Hebrew from Baudin and de Courtenay. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Several classes he took with him. And then he recommended him to his friends later in the, well, 1880s. Please take note that Jan Boudou and de Courtenay was good and he planned it to write a grammar of the Ukrainian language and that was, well, Kulish remembered that Jan Boudin is good. Unfortunately, some of his compatriots and some of his contemporaries uh, among the Ukrainian intellectuals considered Jan Boudin and the Kurtina at the end of the 19th century like, you know, uh, Russify or something like this. Yes, before Boudin became a true partisan of these independent nations and federalization first and then independent Poland. Translating the Bible, he was translating it from what? Uh, at different uh, stages of his career, he was translated from different languages. <laughs> at some point, he was translating definitely from Old Church Slavonic. Then he was using Hebrew, but only just not as the basic original, but only comparing this Church Slavonic with the Hebrew original. And he was definitely using at the end of his life when he decided to translate again the Psalter, and he translated again. Uh, he was using uh, the, uh, and in my book uh, you have these references, uh, the French, the German, 
uh, and uh, the, he called it uh, Oxford translation of the Bible. I, so he called it. So he used at least three versions for only comparison. But he was using it with the Old Church Slavonic mostly. If this is what Old Testament and for New Testament, he knew some Greek from Pulu and Pului, although they became just, you know, not so close at the end of life, but at some point Pului, yes, was helping him with the Greek. Uh, you know, when I was in Ukraine in 1989 in the archive, the Bible uh, was there, that original, um, his writing. Uh, yes, they have different, yes. It was uh, there, yeah. Um, mm. And, uh, but then, when I was there in uh, 2006 or 2007, uh, it wasn't there anymore. It is. Oh, it's still, maybe they've hidden it or something. No, I, I made copies. Did you see this wonderful copies? Yes, yes, yes that I ordered. I paid $500. I have this uh, copies. So they keep them mostly at the Kotubinsky Museum in Chernihiv. The archive of Kulish is in Chernihiv. And then you have these translations and different copies and different witnesses of his uh, manuscripts also at the Vernadsky and plus at the Institute of Literature. Mm -hmm. You have it. But the actual original writer. Yeah, yeah. His own, in his own yeah, hand. Very neat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Think, did you see this? Yes, it's just yeah. very neat and very, you know, calligraphically, you know, 100%. Embellished. In 89, there, were no, uh, there was no digital, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Miss Jovenic was there too, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was copying it. In fact, I, uh, Professor Lutsky had asked me, you know, like, uh, if I had any, uh, you know, how much I had copied, but I mm -hmm. wasn't able to copy very much. Yes, absolutely, without these no devices and means which we have today, yes, it was absolutely possible. But that was a blessing for both institutes because they keep now copies which they made for me, which I paid for with my grant. So they have also copies, particularly of all uh, witnesses and copies of uh, Kulis translation, at least at the Institute of uh, Ukrainian Literature and the Vernadsky, some, some of those. I'm, I'm curious, after Kulis's death, Nitrilovitsky took over and completed the translation of, of the Bible for the Bible Society. Have you had an opportunity to, to look at those two texts and what do they do differently? Yes, yes, uh, I worked with this also. I also worked with uh, Nechui's translations, by the way, his own translations, which they keep at the Institute of Ukrainian Literature. So I compared it actually with their language programs and why, for example, Nechu Levitsky so, felt so offended by all these intrusions by this Galician guy with his friend uh, or uh, editor Alexiuk, uh, which is, just slipped my mind. I mean, Pului and his uh, uh, co-editor when uh, Kulic died. So yes, there were just so many misunderstandings between them because they drastically changed it, uh, not Kulis, as you understand. It was Pului who made these unfortunate changes into his translation. Some of them definitely, he didn't like the script, he didn't like the orthography which they introduced, this typical Galician, well, uh, so definitely he was against it. And plus all these dialectical, for, the dialectal forms which he could not just simply accept. And he almost was ready just to break up with anybody with this project that ever seen. But still, they, he could not do anything. He, he wrote several letters uh, to the widow, to Barvinok. He wrote several letters to the Bible Society. Please remove my name if you publish it again, or just uh, make another translation, because that's not what I submitted as part of my translation. It was just But I'm particularly interested in comparing that is the text, uh, you know, that is Nechui is translating those texts that Kulish didn't finish translating. So, of course, there, there isn't a direct comparison. But stylistically, in terms of the kinds of issues that you're addressing, word choice, uh, church slavonicisms, you know, uh, neologisms, how does Nechui's language compare to Kulish's language when, when he's translating the Bible? No, well, first of all, they, they were several of them. First of all, they just simply divided the translation into several parts. And Levitsky took uh, three or four books, so far as I remember, 
and uh, Puduy took over this, uh, and then uh, they used the translation of Kulish uh, for those uh, uh, books. So basically, they were just simply copywritten, in fact. So Nechulevsky did not uh, complete what was not done. They just simply were doing and done, uh, did what they were supposed to do. And by the way, Herinchenko was the first one to be offered to translate, uh, but Rechenko declined. This is why they decided to invite Nietzsche Levitsky, although they knew that there might be some problems on both uh, sides of this project, actually. Well, luckily, unfortunately, Kulic died by the moment when Nietzsche Levitsky just created this commotion, studying writing letters and uh, writing this, uh, well, everywhere, trying just to change something in this, but it was already actually too late to change something. Uh, stylistically, stylistic, definitely was closer to Kulish, closer. Uh, they were struggling only with uh, how to translate prose and uh, poetry. As you know, we have these prose books, yes, and uh, poetic books. Uh, so they mingle everything, their conception was different. They decided to make prose should read as poetry, and vice versa, poetry should read like prose in your translation. So they were just trying to perhaps create a new translation, a type of the translation actually at that time. And Kulish's translation was very successful in this case. And Nietzsche's one was, I liked it. I liked the original of Nietzsche's. It was just like poetry. And he just simply translated this poetic Bible, but poetic book, and it was poetry. It was fantastic. But they changed later. I mean, Pului uh, changed it. Purpose was to develop this full fledged version of the Ukrainian language. So, do you think he was successful in this? Or, uh, for example, he translated many works which were unavailable before, but mm -hmm. at the same time, because he was so much criticized by so many critics, maybe it discouraged. By, by everybody, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Only two. Maybe very on the contrary, it discouraged educated people from the Ukrainian translation because of this people's mm -hmm. style and they continued reading the Russian. So they were only, if I start with the end of this, so there were two or three positive reviews uh, published in Vesnik Evropy, uh, reviews of his two public, two translations of different uh, books and different varieties and versions of this translation. So not only negative, for example, reviews definitely. And he wanted not to create not only the full-fledged language because he was aware of this task. You cannot just create the whole language. He was what, trying to create two types of the high style, which is first the, bi the biblical style and the second the circular high style, because you need this. Because for the Ukrainian people, he believed, for this enlightenment, you need the translation of the Bible on the one side, and on the other, the other for example, side, you need a translation of Shakespeare and some other classical works available for translation in, in Europe at that time. So basically, he created two styles. Unfortunately, they, they were not accepted due to different reasons. When Kulish is working on Shakespeare, is he consulting Russian versions of Shakespeare? That is, and, and how would they compare? Have you made this comparison? Uh, the same question uh, was posed by Michael Flyer no. <laughs> because he was interested. I'm flattered. <laughs> yeah. Asking questions. I did say no. I did say. <laughs> I explain. Okay. First of all, my book is not about you know no, translation I, I, itself. Yes, but you're right. And they blamed him for consulting too much. For example, the translation made by Kretschmer, uh, if I'm not mistaken, which was very popular at that time, which was the only translation. Uh, it seems to me everything was done in prose, something like this. So he consulted it just for details, for double checking the uh, original, just in case, and looking at some other translations, also Polish translations, to compare. Mm -hmm. Just to not to make some blunders or mistakes, but, you know, which you could find in all those translations, yes. But he was consulting this. And, and do we see influence of... Uh, of those translate that is other than that is checking details that is making sure you understand what Shakespeare is saying that on one level but do we see linguistic influences does he adopt lexical forms from from the Russian that was not part of my project you, you because I wanted that. just to look at his translation as a product mm -hmm. so I was not interested in 
where he borrowed this product or that bought our product. I just look and they said the phenomenon, okay, like a literary tax or literary tax. For me, that was literary tax, which uses this and that, for example, variety of literary language. I, you cannot guarantee that you didn't use because you have so many Russian forms, you have so many Russian church Slavonic forms, and at the same time you have so many French and German, uh, well, borrowings that it's so hard just even to distinguish possible influence in this case. But he was ready to implement, he was ready to borrow even Russian forms to make it more synthetic from this side and Polish from that side, more, make it more synthetic, that perhaps he might have borrowed some forms already used by some Russian, for example, translators. But uh, this is what, for example, Francois wrote about his plagiarizing uh, from, for example, some Russian, for example, texts, which I don't believe is true. So if you find my book interesting, you're just welcome just to buy the book. Uh, you have a discount of 30%. <laughs> and it would be... So how much is the book? Oh, I don't tell me. 80, 89? But perhaps library, at least your library can just order your open. No, the discussion is thirty percent. So off. So it would be fifty nine perhaps. Fifty nine I guess so. I'm not good at this, I just take two I know myself. I have my ten copies which I have just to go to, to give to my sponsors, two sponsors and then mostly just something to Europe, definitely to Poland they asked me about some Ukraine for two, three libraries and uh, some other, perhaps, colleagues which would like to, who would like just to have these copies. So besides you and uh, Nachlik, who else is working on Kurdish? <laughs> uh, it looks like Lutsky, yes. Well, and, I know, but yes. <laughs> but Nachlik, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, and Nachlik, but this is not about his language, it's no. about, it's like scientific or scholarly but, biography, no. right, we call it. seem to have generated uh, interest, uh, you know, in terms of uh, research. That's why what I'm asking. It, who else is there? There is uh, a group of Ukrainian linguists who work on this, but still no book, uh, no major work on the language of Kulish. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so strange. For so many years, we still don't have it. So basically, that's the first one about his language. And what about his uh, uh, translations of, uh, uh, you know, influences through Walter Scott? There's nobody... I didn't see any relation to Walter Scott in some other articles published in Ukrainian, in Ukraine, because practically I worked with all possible bibliographies, references uh, related to collision. I didn't see anything from on this. There is nothing like this. And again, it's a pity that uh, this uh, collection of works prepared by Kritiker, they do not include any type of witnesses and copies which I use, so they just simply re uh, well, reprinting the edition of Shakespeare of 1882. So far that it was issued by uh, the editor, the principal editor of this publication. They are not ready to work on all other copies or some other translations. I don't, I don't think there are the people to do it yet. They wanted, yes, they invited even me, but they told me they were very busy. And I would like to join, for example, at some point, but perhaps already too late. I think that, that's one of Kulish's major problems. The reason there isn't a good edition of Kulish yet is because yeah. the people who would produce a good edition well, yeah, no, Fedoruk, yes, that's only, it seems to me, promoter of this project, and he's doing uh, practically everything, all these notes, comments, and it's all in him. You need mm -hmm. at, at least 100 graduate students working on it. Yeah, perhaps, yes, it would be much, much better. But still, it's, it's a great project, that's fantastic, yes. Thank you very much for your Thank presentation. You. I think you've stimulated a good deal of interest in Kulish, and may, maybe we will generate <laughs> some more scholarly work on, on Panikov. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming.